Good morning, everyone. We warmly welcome you to the inaugural session of the fifth undergraduate research symposium of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences 2023. We welcome our keynote speaker and other participants who are connected with us through online as well. I kindly request you to rise for the national anthem, followed by the silent prayer and lighting the oil lamp. I kindly request you to remain standing for the lighting of oil lamp. Firstly, I kindly call upon Professor Sivakulundu Sri Satgunaraja, the Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to light the oil lamp. Next, I kindly call upon Mrs. Devi Tapodaran the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to light the oil lamp. Next, I kindly call upon the Dean, Graduate Studies, to light the oil lamp. I kindly invite Dr. K. Balan, external member of the faculty board, to light the oil lamp.
I kindly invite M Writers Professor in Shanmugam, external member of faculty board to light the oil lamp. I kindly call upon Dr. Karunai Das Rasaratnam, the chair, Fifth Undergraduate Research Symposium, to light the oil lamp. I kindly call upon Mrs. Vinitra Jagaprakash, the editor, Fifth Undergraduate Research Symposium, to light the oil lamp. I would like to kindly call upon Mr. Nanda Kumar, Nursing Tutor, College of Nursing, to light the oil lamp. I kindly invite Mrs. Kaushalya Dharmendra, the Assistant Registrar of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to light the oil lamp. I kindly call upon the head department of pharmacy of faculty of adult health sciences to light the oil lamp. I kindly call upon the head department of nursing faculty of allied health sciences to light the oil lamp. I kindly invite Head, Department of Medical Laboratory Sciences, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences to light the oil lamp. I kindly call upon a student representative from today's presenters to light the oil lamp. I warmly welcome our Vice Chancellor, the Dean, the Chairperson of the Symposium, Editor and the Secretary to the head table please. Thank you all. It's a great morning. Today we look forward to gain a wholesome of insight through the knowledge dissemination of our own students of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. Now, I am happy to invite Dr. Karunai Das Rasaratnam, the Chair, Fifth Undergraduate Research Symposium of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to deliver the welcome address. So, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to you all. On behalf of the fifth undergraduate research symposium of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, it's with pleasure that I warmly welcome everyone gathered at the Hoover Auditorium here. First of all, I am deeply honored to be entrusted with the responsibility of chairing the fifth undergraduate research symposium. I extend my sincere gratitude to Faculty of Allied Health Sciences for this opportunity. I warmly welcome our Vice Chancellor. Professor Sri Satmaraja for attending this event despite his busy schedule. Thank you, sir, for being with us this morning. I also accordingly welcome the keynote speaker, Professor Nirosini Nirmalan, Chair in Biomolecular Science, University of Salford, Manchester, United Kingdom, jointly, jointly virtually with us. Thank you, madam, for accepting our invitation. It's indeed a privilege to chair your research caliber at our undergraduate research symposium. I hope 
all of you are lucky to have this exposure. I welcome the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, Mrs. Devi Dabodaran, who has been the pillar of support in organizing this event. Thank you, Madam. I also generously welcome our special invitees, deans of other faculties, council members, external members of the faculty board of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, and other dignitaries who are being with us here. I am pleased to welcome the academic and academic supportive staff of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences who have supported us in many ways to organize this symposium. Undergrade Symposium is an annual event of the faculty and it's the fifth undergrade research symposium. Although the previous four symposium were jointly organized by the Faculty of Medicine and Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, it's the first time this symposium is solely organized by the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. Probably the trend in healthcare is rapidly changing worldwide. Every patient data in the healthcare system is an asset to the world as every patient care and treatment strategies currently used in healthcare were learned from caring for previous patients or analyzing their data. The research using this data lead to novel discovery of cures and treatment of life-threatening diseases and improve the healthcare system. Remarkably, recent innovations in artificial intelligence, molecular diagnostics, and bioinformatics have created a new platform for early diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of chronic diseases. In this manner, the today's theme of, of the symposium was said to be as strengthening healthcare through research and innovation. Since producing the new knowledge is one of the ultimate goals of education, the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences also trains and motivates its graduate to produce new knowledge and innovations by conducting their research project as a part of their degree. Today's symposium will showcase the research activity of the 12th batch of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. I congratulate all the presenters who have completed their project despite this COVID-19 pandemic and present economic crisis. Notably, most of the students produce primary data during their research project. I hope all of you have a time to join our oral presentations that will witness the solid foundations given by the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences in undergrad research. Before I end, I wish to acknowledge the deep sense of gratitude to our sponsors, Bank of Ceylon, Thunderbury Branch, Immunolab PVT Limited, Organic Trading, and the first batch graduate of the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences for their generous financial support. I also sincerely thank the organizing committee of the fifth undergrad research symposium for their tremendous support in organizing this event. I hope all of you have a pleasant morning. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, I kindly call upon Mrs. Devita Bodharan, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to address the gathering. Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Sri Satmaraja, keynote speaker, Professor Niroshini Nirmalan, Symposium Chair, Dr. Karanadas, the Dean, Graduate Studies, External Member of Faculty Board of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, Nursing Tutors from College of Nursing, Professors, Staff from Faculties of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences, Distinguished Invitees, Presenters of Research Papers, Students and all the participants of the Research Symposium. Very, very good morning to you all. It's my great pleasure and privilege to take this part in the inauguration ceremony of 5th Undergraduate Research Symposium. Actually, this is our first symposium independently organized by the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. Previously, we organized four undergraduate research symposium jointly with Faculty of Medicine. Though the staff of this faculty is less in number, below 20 in number, all of us join together and bring this symposium a successful one. The main objective of this research symposium 
is to provide an opportunity and a platform to our students to engage in research activities, present their research findings in this forum, and then involve in scholarly discussions. I am sure that this symposium will provide a friendly surroundings for the students, researchers, and academics to share their ideas and views with their peers. The unit of allied health sciences was established in 2006 and then it was upgraded into a full-fledged faculty of allied health sciences in December 2019. Since its inception, the allied health sciences has been producing quality graduates with individual research work in the field of health sciences in their final year. Until 11th batch, the last year, for all the students from three disciplines were involved in individual research. But due to the increased number of students and the unavailability of um, chemicals, consumables, the research was termed as a group research and so far around 60 researchers are conducted by our students in the last year. But for this research under you, undergraduate research symposium, we received only 28 research papers. Dear students, this is a good opportunity for you to disseminate your findings. So for the next URS, every student should publish your abstract and cultivate the research culture in the universities. The valuable research findings will help the future generations to involve in more active research in coming years. I thank our symposium chair, Dr. Karone Das, a young staff from Medical Laboratory Sciences, for taking the responsibilities of the chair and our secretary, Mrs. Satya, lecturer in the Department of Pharmacy, who met with an accident on the second day of the research discussion, but continuously worked very hard while being in the bed to organize this symposium. My sincere gratitude also goes to our keynote speaker, Professor Niroshini Nirmalan, for spending her valuable time with us and sharing her knowledge with our students, Madam. I am very much sure that our students will make this opportunity to enhance their skills further and be first in line to compete with the world. My wholehearted congratulations and wishes for our students and my heartiest greetings for a successful symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. Next, I am extremely happy to invite Professor Siva Sri Satkunaraja, the Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to address the gathering with his enlightening words. Adiya in Adubumahi, Alavila Alabumahi, Sodia Unarumahi, Tondria Purlumahi, Pedi Ahamahi, Pandumahi, Mahi, Podia and Retilla Podanadam Poti Poti. I belong to the Faculty of Science, especially in the physical sciences where we think about the entire universe, the environment, then the five elements, or in the periodic table, the hard and odd elements, and their evolution. So in the 1960s, we happened to a collaboration. Then we have in the science faculty, the biological science. Today, our keynote speaker from molecular sciences. And now you are in a forum where the symposium is organized for allied health sciences. Then it support very much to the medical sciences, then social sciences, and now everything called science. So what is science? It's basically is organized form of knowledge. Knowledge is there in the indigenous form, wisdom, and descending form, reveal scriptures, and all kind of setup, the knowledge is there. But the modern man, he his desire to know in evident-based manner. So he has been digging 
digging, digging to find more fountains. Where to dig? Because we are human beings, we are supported by the nature. So one of the scientists said, Joseph Fourier, of course he's a mathematician as well as a theoretical physicist or engineer. He said, the fruitful source of discovery is the nature. Even human beings are a part of the nature. So in the 1960s, a collaboration between the botanists and the mathematicians, the Greek and Watson, found a way for DNA structure, the helix structure, the strand for DNA. Then the molecular science exploded from that day onwards. So you may wonder why these scientists are working. So much people are working from a distance. So underneath the earth, there are elements working. Even the earth worm is working. Worm is working. We don't see that. We only see the fruits. But the roots are running into so many meters depth. Even sometimes digging the rocks and getting the water from the well, you know, for us, uh, the well-rooted rocks, the roots goes and spread. So we are indebted to many, many, many human beings for their contribution in the knowledge cultivation. So in this regard, thousand years ago, not much, because this earth is 4,500 million years old. And the human civilization goes into many, many million years. According to science, maybe 40,000 years. But if you go to Ramayana and all these three the Yugas and so much evidence happened. Even today they say the five planets on the one line. If the begins of Kali Yuga, the definition, all nine planets in one line. Complete eclipse. That's a definition. So now we are seeking from our cosmology and all kind of modern development of cosmology. Now we know the February 15th of 5,000 years ago. February 15th, they were online. That's the day the Krishna departed. The new dam Yuga started. So in this Yuga, we are running into now around 5,000 years. So it has run for another 400,000 years. It's cyclic everything because, you know, we are now drawing fuel from the earth because it was earlier it was dumped. So it, the earth continuously processing everything. Even our body, everything is getting processed. Input, output. But we have our knowledge. That domain is expanding. Not only knowledge expanding, the universe is expanding. So how many disciplines? Every atom has a story. My son sometimes tell me. Every atom has a story. So in the Senjola children, I went Patta or Andula and Klinochi. My friend is running, KP Patmana is my batchmate. Then he said there are 400 kids are there. Then he said 400 stories are there, Sri. It's very difficult to narrate all of them. All are different. So we are unique, but we joined together in the Allied Health Faculty and you enter the faculty as undergrad. So you are going to hear from a well-recognized person, Niroshini Nirmalan. Nirmalan was here a couple of weeks ago. So he, they were brought up of our land. Now they're decorating the top centers in the world in their journey. No barriers when they come to research and development. No barriers. That is called the academic freedom. Not the academic freedom, not to sign the register and register and go away from the work. Academic freedom means you are given a global passport. You go anywhere and work. You are welcome because you are contributing to the knowledge creation. So thousand years ago in a theology setup, the Balagama University started, then the Oxford 900 years. Cambridge 800 years, the Paris is around 900 years. So that European Renaissance culture is exp exploding. So that is ascending culture. But our tradition, so much come, so much thing came from the descending culture. 
So we, in the Marathon, we got from Agastya. So medicinal plants are plenty in our land. But medicines come from pharmacology. The processing coming from pharmacology. Medicinal plants are plenty. That's identified even in indigenous medicine. But now the science is contributing. How this happened? So universe is expanding. Why is the universe expanding? Is a, is a, is a, to accommodate our activities. Because so much of energy is produced, so many activities going on. So entropy is increasing. The universe is expanding. So one day the universe was a single point, the material universe. So it came from, people say, from a spiritual universe, a spiritual sky. That's called Brahman. That's an eternal one. Even Lord Krishna says the eternal one is three-fourth. The material one expands and one day is collapsed. The half light time of sun is gone. We know. Hydrogen fuse and the energy come, so half of the fuel is running out. So the half is remaining. So every planetary system collapses. So what we do? So in our existence in this world, maybe a hundred years. So we were in the secondary school, we just following the syllabus, formal education, what we have been asked to learn, we learn. Now in the tertiary education, you chose your disciplines. So allied, allied health science is one of the celebrated disciplines because all over the world there is a demand. Whether it's nursing, or laboratory sciences, or radiology, or physiotherapy, and everywhere, it's the most celebrated science. Of course, you, medical science is another troubleshooting, but this has to do with the maintenance and diagnostic, that's the molecular science. Come the, today, I read the abstract, the lady is going to talk about the journey she had about the drug uh, manufacturing for malaria, and her is going to enlighten you about the, the research careers and kind of opportunity you could have. Even I am a man from a village, a village, a remote village in Sri Lanka. So my interest and uh, you know perseverance to know something on with the numbers and you know the shape and quantities led me to Edinburgh, one of the top centers in medicine. Edinburgh, where the James Clark Maxwell born and he unified the electricity and magnetism. That's what the everything today, last week we opened the Center for Digital Epidemiology. Where how the digital comes, where VC media are capturing, because that man sacrificed his life, put this electricity and magnetism together. He said they are inseparable. Earlier, Ohm's law, Paradise law, Fleming laws, they were separate things. People thought the magnetism exists without the electricity. No. So everything is dynamic, everything is running, everything is evolving. So much of knowledge creation is happening. It's very difficult to follow. But at the same time, this domain is infinitely large. No one can ever going to get this domain gets saturated. It's always open. So modern teams are coming, sub-teams are coming, new discovery from the physics helping so much of diagnostic methods. Your scanners, the CT, MR, and all kind are coming, you know, the scientists, the, those scientists may sacrifice their life in the laboratories. So we are the people getting the benefits. Whom we make a benefit? To the public. So non-intervention diagnostic methods are expanding. Non-intervention. One day they may have even, not even putting into the big CT scanners and putting you in the pain. No, not sending the, you know, even the biopsy, cameras inside. There's another kind of radiology coming. Who knows? But it's all happened due to our solitude, sacrifice. 
because supporting human beings is called in our culture dharma the best dharma ever known is sanadana dharma since adiyai naduvumagi alavila alavumagi sodiyai so all these planets are made for us not for anybody else we are the only being exploiting the nature others are working for us animals snakes all are doing their prescribed duties we are the one keep on exploiting improving creating a couple of days ago a swiss based two musicians were here one pianist and one singer so they create even the god will be very pleased the wonderful exercise they did so we develop music we develop mathematics we develop physics then the fundamental science out of that the engineering thing born now we have a genetic engineering molecular engineering then molecular sciences discoveries so all are for what then the allied health science people and the medical science people you are the one actually made them in the utility purpose for that purpose the young people have given the best possible environment that is a research environment that is i call himalayas the best possible environment in the earth crust the himalayas the best water come the ganga origin and so many rivers come so that feed to china that feed to iran that feed to even the eastern bloc that feed to india everything come from that mountain the top of top resources are there similarly whoever dwells there in the haritwar or in the all these areas they are the one of the blessed ones similarly in your educational career in the knowledge cultivation those who are entering the research realm as a post graduate student now the undergrad are given this research opportunity to taste how the honey like that is to taste so 1 million miles of journey is now life in the research begin with the first step one step so this is a inauguration step for you is a wonderful thing that our allied health staff very small faculty is still you know this faculty is struggling to hold on to have this infrastructure the pioneers of the faculty professor uh, shan moling and now is in the your faculty board the former vice chancellor and the uh, our former dean now has just left they are the people and with this nandi soration coming tomorrow day after tomorrow day after tomorrow nandi ha huh? swanyana sundaram the famous pioneer of the medical faculty he actually led uh, his twin uh, two, two daughters into this kind of a discipline so they are now serving the purpose you understand it's a chain thing so everything is done for the purpose in this body i always say on the arambi palava virind 61 years ago i had a 62 second birthday a couple of days ago i was in a one cell embryo like a seed like a the, the seed of a almanac this um, uh, big tree tamarind tree so that's grows 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 so i am being growing i am getting the input from the nature since that day i was in the womb outside the womb is still going on but the problem in the human being the disease and old age that's where the allied health science come in disease so early detection will help us to resolve so many problems because the medical professionals are ready to serve but detection is important so reporting is important so now i think youngsters mls uh, our pharmacy nursing what all related things so you are a wonderful uh, arab people going to decorate glorify our land today so many private practices are coming in jafna 
not anywhere else, next to Colombo. Colombo is a cosmopolitan. People are migrating there every day. But Japna being with their own people, having all the resources to run this place. In every, I am a vice chancellor, every month I see management committee, our dean graduate studies running so many program, even health science program, master program. So where do you get the resources? We don't have a single staff. We've got this land fee. Here our nursing school staff are here. Because it's all this war time. It's running beautifully. Because the people, people, that is the best resource. So we have that. So we continue to create that and giving them the topmost experience, the Everest experience, the Everest, the lady coming from the Everest, she claimed the Everest. So Niroshini, so we want to hear from her, huh? hearing from the wise, we become wise. That's the best way. That's the purpose of having the keynote speech also. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next will be the release of the proceedings of the symposium. I am happy to invite Mrs. Minitra Jagaprakash, the editor, 5th Undergraduate Research Symposium, to address the gathering. Good morning to you all. It's my great pleasure to be the editor of the Undergraduate Research Symposium. So the fifth Undergraduate Research Symposium has organized by the Faculty of Allied Health Sciences independently under the theme of the strengthening healthcare through research and innovation. This symposium provides the opportunity for the undergraduates to publish their research findings in this forum and get experienced. There were 28 abstracts submitted by the undergraduates of Faculty of Allied Health Sciences. The abstracts were sent to the reviewers in the relevant field with the review report form. Based on the blind review process, all the abstracts were accepted with the minor and major corrections. This review process ensured the standard of the abstracts published in this symposium. I would like to thank the undergraduates who have submitted their research findings in this symposium and thank all the reviewers for reviewing the abstracts in a short period of time. I appreciate everyone who provided their inputs and suggestions to make this symposium proceedings in a standard level. So now I kindly request Prof. Sri Satkunraja sir, the Vice Chancellor, University of Jaffna, to receive the first proceedings of the fifth undergraduate research symposium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Next, I kindly call upon Ms. Gopika Tillenadan, lecturer, Medical Laboratory Sciences, to introduce the keynote speaker of the event, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure I take this privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, a woman of virtue and simplicity, Professor Nirosini Nirmalan. Professor Nirosini Nirmalan is the Chair of Molecular Biosciences at the School of Science, Engineering and Environment at the University of Salford, UK. She is originally a Sri Lankan who got graduated from the Faculty of Medicine University, University of Colombo in the year 1991 and began her career as a clinician as well as a lecturer in parasitology at the Faculty of Medicine 
University of Colombo. After moving to UK, she pursued her Master of Science and PhD from the University of Salford in Manchester, followed by her postdoctoral training at the Manchester Interdisciplinary Biocenter, University of Manchester. It was where she received the training in proteomics, which is supported by her progress in studies into infectious diseases and malaria in particular. Upon having a great success in this area, she started working as a senior scientist at the Cancer Research UK Clinical Centre, St. James Hospital, University of Leeds in 2007 and this is where she pursued her interest in omics and label-free quantitation. Later on, she moved to the University of Salford in the year 2010 and she took up her current role as the senior lecturer. So it is with great perseverance and hard work, she reached her current role and now her contribution extends over a range of teaching programs at both the undergraduate level and postgraduate level, including the biomedical sciences, human biology, infectious diseases, drug design and biotechnology. And in addition, over the last 10 years, she has supervised many PhD and MSc students. Professor Niroshini is leading two research groups, one focused on the drug discovery for novel malaria treatments and the other on investigating trauma biomarkers to help predict poor clinical outcomes for trauma patients. So far, she has numerous scientific public publications published in popular journals. So today, Professor Nirmalan's keynote speech is on the topic, scientific research careers, opportunities, challenges, and rewards. This address will explore the different routes for achieving a career in research and discuss the inherent opportunities and challenges therein. The talk will be modeled on Professor Nirmalan's research career working on drug discovery in malaria. So on the whole, we are so lucky to have her today with us despite of the distance and her hectic schedules. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Niroshni Nirmalan to deliver her keynote speech. Over to you, ma'am. Right, can I just check the um, sound system? Can, can everyone hear me? Right, I'll just uh, first try and share. Um, just to start, um, Vice Chancellor, Deans of Faculty, uh, Heads of Department, um, Organizing Committee, Distinguished Guests, Staff, uh, and of course, most of all, students. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure and a privilege uh, to be invited uh, to deliver this keynote uh, at, at, at your fifth symposium. I'm, I'm truly grateful and um, I just hope that the technology will hold uh, and I, I hope that there is something in, useful for you, uh, useful and relevant for you um, uh, to, to take home from this, this talk. Uh, let me try and share this screen of mine and then, okay. Okay, so I, I assume you can see my screen, okay? I think you can, yes. Uh, so getting back to the topic, uh, good morning. I think uh, there was a very um, big introduction of, of, my, of what, what I have done. I'm not sure I actually deserve all that, but thank you. Uh, I, have, I have kind of arranged this talk uh, more for to benefit the undergraduate students, uh, yes, from a research perspective as well, but also uh, also on a wider perspective, right? Uh, yes. So if you look at this um, slide, it should give you an idea of the student learning journey from school to university and beyond. Uh, 
I presume that most of the students here sit in that middle box where you are at university, a transition from school where teachers teach you knowledge. Uh, here you do get some knowledge from your teachers, but there is an expectation of independent learning. Uh, it is beyond that research and, and discovery and generation of new knowledge that's more in the postgraduate field that that really crystallizes for you to you know, take control and generate new knowledge. And that is where research and discovery uh, really happen. So that is your forward journey. And whatever the career you do, right, be it a professional course leading to nursing or laboratory science or a research career per se, uh, research is, is important because it, it is new learning. Uh, it, it adds to your knowledge. It informs your practices. It allows you to improve your practices because otherwise you're just accepting what is happening. Uh, most of you will be familiar with many of these modules and this is the wonderful thing about basic sciences. Basic sciences gives you that wide opportunity to explore a very wide field of science. Microbiology, immunology, biotechnology, drug dis discovery and all that. So you really are empowered with a whole lot of knowledge and tools that, that will allow you to do whatever really outside uh, you know, your chosen fields. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit outside of research itself because I think it's really very important. Uh, we, I, have, I was brought up of course in Sri Lanka, I had all my education, primary and secondary in Sri Lanka. Uh, and to, a, to an extent, we, you know, the focus for, for us has always been studies, get your, get your degree, get your first class, and that is, that is all. We are in a world today which is highly competitive. And while that is important and that is a basic necessary necessity, we need more. So at your age, this was my, my plan and I thought, yes, life, I start off here, this is what I want to be, and that's my journey. But in reality, that is not the case. And that is not the case for all of us, right? So we, we must understand that. There are mountains to climb, there are rivers to swim through, there are storms to weather and all kinds of things. So right from the word go, right from where you are now, success in life is also about preparation, right? Do you have the boat to cross? Do you have the climbing skills? Can you make the bridge? Do you have your umbrellas and so on? So uh, careers and getting somewhere in life is also about preparing for those storms and unexpected incidents. So when does career planning begin? It begins right now where you are as an undergraduate, right? Whether you're your first year or second year or third year, it doesn't matter. It is, it, it is an early, it, it has to start as soon as possible. It has to, you have to plan, right? And what are you looking at? You're looking at acquiring uh, a set of knowledge, skills and attitudes, right? We, we forget, particularly in the West, we forget attitudes. And, and that's caused so much, so much disruption to society. Knowledge, again, the Vice Chancellor summarized it beautifully. Yes, knowledge is, is, is very wide, very wide, right? Getting your data is one thing, that turning it into information is one thing, turning into knowledge is another step, but ultimately you're talking about wisdom as well, right? And that is a process from just data converting things to wisdom is a process and experience is important. Uh, so, so uh, yes, so it, it does take time. And as, as you go through life, you are gathering these essential skills and knowledge and attitudes. And the whole point of it is, is eventually to be, become, you know, a, a 
a good human, I suppose, and, and lead a real good life. When it comes to skills, again, we do have to look at the core skills, your laboratory skills, your research skills, that your, your course will give you, your core knowledge that your course will give you. And that is important. That, that is a given. That is the basic, right? That, that's, that's the background, on, that's the foundation. But you must also look at the other softer skills, which are becoming increasingly important for life. Your written communication, your ability to speak, your ability to work in a team, leadership skills, innovation, analytical skills, your work experience, time, computing skills. Uh, the Vice Chancellor told you about the center that was, that was created recently. What an amazing uh, advance. What an amazing vision. So that's, that's where you have to look. Verbal communication, again, is important. And central to this is reading, right? That habit of re reading, which I think your grandfather and my grandfather would have told, you know, read, read. We, are, we come from a culture where education it takes priority. So don't lose that. Don't lose that with time. Don't allow the buzz of life to take all those skills away. And of course, this is the other important thing. Basic stuff. Right? Things we take for granted, which are disappearing from society today. I teach today and it's very, very difficult to see, uh, you know, enabling altruism, punctuality, honesty, integrity, no, you know, doing something for somebody else. So those are, those are core values in our culture and, and those are core values in our society, the society you're growing in, so the society I grew up in, uh, you know, where teachers would stay through the evening to, to teach you. Nobody does that here. They will ask for workload, they will ask, ask for money, they will ask for time. So so we have to change, we have to change. And that, 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 that those wrong attitudes are reflected in the society we live today. So yes, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, we are born we, into a culture which has all these rich characteristics. Take those with you and then learn from outside. There's a lot to learn, learn from outside, but keep these core values, protect the core values. Uh, right, so research. What is research? Research is what we do when we ask a question. Research is what we do when we have a problem to solve. And of course, um, if research is about scrutiny, research is about rigor. And there are a whole range of rules and regulations and methodologies that are there to make sure that rigor is, is, um, is put into research. So you will hear words like ethics, risk assessments, statistics, sampling, control, biological replicates, technical replicates, validation, publication, peer review, so on and so forth, right? These all have, have been defined. I'm not going to go into detail, um, but all that is, is meant to make sure that the, the, the work we do has integrity and uh, can be relied upon to make decisions, because that's what it is. Research is to inform something else. Um, just uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about research and talk, talk to you briefly about my journey in research uh, and, and, and hopefully identify and, uh, some of the problems that, are, that come across. And like I said, it was not a straight journey. Uh, yeah, but there were there, there are a lot of uh, problems, issues, uh, f you know, fallbacks, all that. But yes, uh, in the end, you have to you have to get 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 to somewhere. So uh, me, born in Sri Lanka, born in born in Jaffna. Yeah. So yes, born in Jaffna actually, and then had all my schooling, all my schooling, primary and secondary in a small school. Uh, St. Mary's Convent, right? Um, something that I probably, if I have to um, identify one place where I have to be grateful to for what I am, it has to be that school. It has to be the school and to those nuns who taught me everything, really, from values to the way I speak to to, to everything, right? So I, I'm, I'm really grateful for, for that, St. Mary's and, and, and the uh, Carmelite nuns there. Uh, I went to medical school, 
like we are, you know, that that's the, if you do bio, you end up in medical school. I don't think there was much thought given there. Um, and of course, medical school turned out to be the biggest hurdle because it was 10 years. It was supposed to be five years. But if I don't think, I think the students here are too young to re realize, uh, to, to remember uh, the JVP turmoil and, and the wars and all that. So, yes. It turned out, it's not because I, I failed, but, you know, medical school turned out for me and my husband, Nirmala. We spent 10 years in medical school. Our first degree was 10 years. Um, it, seemed, uh, it seemed terrible at that time, but then looking back, I think, you know, that's what, that's, that, all, that was also character building. You know, it, it made us cope with everything else. Um, in medical school itself, and that's, that, that's the Colombo Medical Faculty where I went to, um, I worked as a clinician for a brief period of time, but joined the joined academia quite quite early. Um, so research and interrogation and asking questions, I think, was part of my uh, part of my personality. And um, even back in Sri Lanka, I joined as a lecturer in the medical faculty. Uh, and of course, for my postgraduate studies, I came to this place where I'm working now, the, the, the University of Salford, where I, because it was um, one of the three UK centers uh, in parasitology. So you had the Liverpool School of Medicine, the London School of Medicine, and third was, of course, uh, the University of Salford, where they had a, probably the biggest concentration of parasitologists. So I came here, did my master's. Uh, got a call to do my PhD, then went on. After your master's and PhD, which is the the research route, if you're following a research career. So yes, I kind of came out of clinical medicine despite doing ten years of of medicine. Um, I, I I pursued the the, the research route, uh, and of course had a had a very very good stint in research where I worked at. The University of Manchester, you missed uh, in my postdoctoral work. Uh, so, you know, institutes where the where, where big Nobel Prize winners have come from. So it, it's a great privilege actually to draw on 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 that kind of a background. Um, you know that you know post DNA and genomic sequencing, there's a whole field of omics whether you call it proteomics or metabolomics or, or whatever it is, uh, a whole new field of omics, high throughput uh, knowledge there coming from uh, from the first discovery of the PCR, from the discovery of the DNA, double strand, and then PCR, I suppose, um, where, you know, the human genome was sequenced and now practically everything, the genomes of everything else is sequenced. Um, so my background actually was in omics and 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 looking into uh, mass spectrometry. Although I had no chemistry experience, I had to learn all that. But it was a it was a fantastic time getting into research. Uh, that then enabled me to get into academia. Getting into academia, co-academia is pretty pretty tough in in in, in, in here uh, and. Um, and that was something I wanted to do because I also liked, loved teaching. And, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity to uh, probably educate the next generation of youngsters. So, yes, um, I went back to the University of Salford, this time as a senior lecturer. So I was never a lecturer. I moved from senior scientist to senior lecturer. And then, of course, um, a couple of years ago, about four or five years ago, um, I was made professor, and, and that, that's that's where I am. So academia is is a is a is a kind of a mixture of many things, and that makes it uh, very interesting for me because um, you know variety. I think is the spice of life. So so you have the opportunity of doing high quality research, leading your own research group. You could teach. You have to teach. Um, and that is again a wonderful experience because it keeps your mind um, mind clear. So you know, uh, particularly as you age, you, you realize that that, that stimulation uh, is important. So yes, I'm going to be 60 next year. So having that constant interaction with students, learning new knowledge, researching, uh, you know, take that, that that's a one, that's a wonderful privilege, really. 
leadership. I've been in leadership roles. I've, I've led, led the departments and I've had various university roles. And of course, social responsibility, that's something we all do. Right? We all have to do. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to talk to you about is a, is a small, is an area, just one strand of research, because I want to tell a story that is relevant, relevant, probably more relevant to Sri Lanka. Uh, and that is the, the malaria research I did, I do. So even back in Sri Lanka, in the medical faculty, I was in the department of parasitology, I, I told you. And uh, I worked with Professor Kamini Mendes who later went on to join the WHO, the whole rollback uh, malaria initiative. So, so giants, you know, giants in her field. Uh, so, and and um, I had the privilege of working with her uh, and she, she was my first mentor. Uh, so malaria is something I learned. I, I kind of, the interest I got in Sri Lanka, I came to Salford Uni and, and Throughout my career, that has been a constant. Uh, malaria, anti-malaria drug discovery, look at proteomics of malaria, the first proteomic maps for malaria, all that, um, you know, I've had, uh, I've, I've, I've been uh, dealing with. So coming to Salford, coming to Salford as a senior lecturer, one of the first things I had to re-establish uh, was the class three uh, pathogen facility to, to start malaria malaria culture so uh, for the last 12 years we have been continuously culturing malaria and of course um, coming to my stage I, I hardly go to the lab now uh, but I've had a wonderful group of students uh, who have supported uh, the various aspects of, of my research and I think I just start thanking them because it is these young people, hardworking young people from different parts of the world, actually, from India to uh, Nigeria to South Africa to um, Iraq, the UK. So uh, quite a lot of quite a quite a diverse bunch of very very clear, clever students who have uh, supported the research. Right. So what were we looking at? This is a map I, I, I'm really proud of showing, and this is the latest malaria map. Right. I'm not proud of the fact that there is a lot of red there. Still a big, uh, big health issue, a global health issue. Uh, probably the biggest, still dis uh, the biggest um, uh, killer disease, infectious killer disease, uh, up there with tuberculosis and HIV. And unfortunately, uh, it's the most overcrowded and the most vulnerable part of the world that is exposed to this awful disease. What I'm proud of, of course, is that is the color that Sri Lanka has achieved. That little green dot in the sea of red, what an incredible achievement that as a country um, we have managed to eradicate a, a horrendous illness. So, uh, of course, eradicating is one thing, but also maintaining that status is also going to be a challenge because this is an awful parasite, right? This is an awful parasite. Uh, drugs for this parasite, the frontline drug is a plant product, Artemisia, Artemisinin from Artemisia annua. And if you know the history of malaria, um, a long time ago, uh, uh, for a long time in the history of malaria, uh, the disease was kept at bay by quinine. Again, another plant product. So, so there is a trend. Plant products, plants have have grown. Again, the vice chancellor mentioned that you know, plants have grown. Nature has grown and evolved for much longer than you and me. And along with it, they have evolved amazing molecules, which we uh, haven't really tapped into. Uh, and the diversity really exists in, in, in the southern part of the world, of the world, you know, Africa, India, Sri Lanka. So there's, there's so much work there, which we're probably sitting on uh, from a drug discovery point of view. And if you take the history of malaria, there's no doubt that plant products uh, have been the mainstay of controlling this disease. And the two main plants were quinine, chinchona, uh, and all its derivatives, and of course, 
uh, Artemis names, which is now, and this is this is a Chinese uh, invention. Uh, China discovered this, and it was a big project. And Professor Yu Yu Tu, who is who is pictured there, was given the Nobel P Nobel Prize for Medicine recently for the discovery of Artemis name. So, uh, talking about pharma, pharma, um, and th there is th there are, there are huge issues the way the world is working, and because pharma pharmacy pharma is about profit. And uh, anti-malarial drugs cost one or two pence. Pharma cannot make that profit. And therefore, unless the governments and the research centers uh, in countries where the disease is endemic take the initiative, depending on pharma is not going to go anywhere. So we have Artemis in name because the Chinese government uh, entrusted uh, this project after the Vietnam War, actually, uh, the, the, to, to, to screen its natural products, to screen its natural products, uh, tap into traditional medicines. But we have, we have our own Ayurveda um, background, but this is Chinese traditional medicine. And a, a long 40-year-old project gave Artemis name. And of course, China gave uh, the, the drug to the world free of charge, no patents. No Western company, drug company would do that uh, because it's driven by profits, unfortunately. But, and, and uh, for the chemists among you, uh, this is the point I'm trying to highlight, the, the richness of our natural resource. When the active product for artemisinin was isolated, uh, the double bond there you see within that ring I'm, no, I'm not a chemist, so I don't quite understand how to call it, but that double uh, bond there within the ring was, was the first time we, uh, you know, we knew that it was possible, right? So you, you can see how over time and how uh, over evolution, plants have developed these amazing molecules, but equally you can also understand why a parasite as complex as the malaria parasite requires such... Uh, unusual products uh, to control it, right? Of course, bad news is also there, drug resistance, right? And the, the bad news about drug resistance is uh, the, the traditional drug discovery pipeline, you know, from bench to bedside, where you have various steps, you develop a target, you screen it in vitro, then it goes to animal work, then you screen it for sensitivity, for, for clinical safety, uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and you know, then the clinical trials, it really takes up from 15 to 17 years. It's time we do not have at the moment because artemisinin resistance is already starting in Thailand. And usually you have about 10 years once resistance starts uh, for that drug to become inactive. So there are no drugs in the pipeline, uh, no effective drugs in the pipeline. And therefore, there is a big question. So that was the research question we were trying to, uh, uh, to address. What is the alternative? Uh, one of the um, c concepts, it was not applied to malaria at the time. I'm talking about, about eight or nine years ago. This is when we started. Uh, is the concept of drug repositioning. So the traditional discovery pipeline that I mentioned, the 15 to 17 years, is for a new product. But uh, there are so many drugs that we are using. There are thousands of drugs that are already in use where safety profiles are known, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics are known, but they have only been tested for a particular disease. So drug repositioning was coming into fashion in cancer and other rare diseases where people were screening, scientists were screening big uh, drug libraries already, you know, patent expired libraries where they were screening it for different diseases. So most of these drugs are usually made for one disease and not not screened for anything else. So this this seemed a really neat idea. So the, one of the first drug repositioning studies for malaria was started by my group, where we decided to screen you know, a, a, a big drug library. I think it was about 1,700 um, drugs. We worked with pharma, with the pharma, pharmaceutical company to screen these drugs. 
uh, at Salford University and to see uh, how, how uh, whether any of it was, was actually effective for malaria. So, and actually, actually, we came across quite a lot, right? Of course, there were anti-cancer drugs, anti-psychotic drugs, antibiotics, and of course, they're existing because it was a bl blinded study. So my students wouldn't know which was the anti-malarial, which wasn't. Um, and therefore, we did come across about 50 potential candidate hits, right? Um, I'm not going to, going to talk about, um, we, we couldn't take, take forward all, but we have taken forward uh, quite a few, about five or six of these leads. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to talk about one, one drug uh, that that uh, one one drug that came from this and the story because I think it is an interesting story. It's not necessarily um, uh, you know I, I I still don't know where it will go, but it it is an interesting story and it's and and it's probably relevant to Sri Lanka, right? Of course, um, many other links were taken and I'm not going to take go, go into that. Um, is there any medics, uh, particularly from my vintage, uh, in the audience? you will remember the name emetine. So one of the compounds that came up on the list, pretty high on the list as a highly effective drug for malaria, was this drug called emetine. Emetine is no longer used. It was stopped being used in 1980s. But, but um, and this, this is, you know, my, my days as a medical student in Sri Lanka in Dr. Ramachandran's ward, um, I, I distinctly remember how extensively this drug was used to treat amoebic dysentery and amoebic liver abscesses. So it wasn't a pleasant drug, and the word emetine tells you that emetine is emesis. It causes a lot of vomiting, right? So um, because it wasn't pleasant, it wasn't withdrawn, but it was replaced by a safe alternative called metronidazole. So emetine, the biggest issue was it had it had it it, it was vomiting, uh, emesis, but it also had some cardiotoxicity, which was dose dependent. So the treatment of emetine, the dosage of emetine was very wide. You could start off with very very uh, lower dose for for the intestinal amoebiasis, but you could actually go into very high doses. Um, parental doses, for, I think it was intramuscular, for for the treatment of hepatic amoebiasis, which was and abscesses, which is very, very resistant. Uh, so it was at those very high doses that you saw the cardiotoxicity. So the, the, the side effects were dose dependent, right? But the moment, what really attracted me to this drug, it was almost like a personal project, so I put a, put a PhD student on it, was also the fact that it is a plant product, right? It is from Cephalus cipacanquahua, uh, and uh, it was it was a plant product. And and for me, I thought you know we, we must explore this. We must explore this plant product because the history of anti malarial you know uh, useful anti malarial drugs has been plant products. So let's let's look at look into this. And of course, you have to do a whole range of tests. In killing profiles and all that to 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 get the publication and we 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 did it and it had it had very good good um, anti malarial efficacy and we sent this publication to um, to to the journals uh, um, and of course got a straightforward rejection a very, it it was the first time I got uh, such a strong rejection because the the professors from the Liverpool School were were, were were very, very harsh. They almost said, you know, what is wrong with you? What, 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 you know, th this is absurd. This shouldn't be allowed. And, um, and they referred to, they referred to in the, in the review, in their, in their referee's comments, they referred to it as a poison. And um, I mean, this, this really upset me because, because, you know, I knew it was used uh, extensively, right? Um, the, the cardiotoxicity was there, but that was at very high dosage. And yes, emesis was a problem, right? You, you do not bring in a, a, a drug that causes emesis into, you know, into, a, into a public domain. But things have moved, right? 
things have moved and and there's so much you can do you can you know do combination therapy you can you can do formulations you can do all kinds of things you can add an antiemetic so if you had did have a good good anti malarial effect the emesis was a, was a, was a local problem that could have been solved you know long acting preparations and so on it was only then that i then went into the emetine safety data so i looked at the emetine data safety data this is the west, this is the the document about the drug that this is the bible and goodness me it said fatal if swallowed so yes people the scientists in the west would have first consulted this and said fatal if swallowed and if you look at this if swallowed immediately call the poison center and this really perplexed me because um no wonder you know if somebody didn't know if somebody had it worked in sri lanka or india and um, been familiar with how frequently this drug was used had not worked in dr ramachandran's ward you know he was an expert on amoebic liver abscesses you know you you wouldn't you wouldn't you you would accept this because this is the document the, the safety data sheet for emetin so i did a lot of i i i did a lot of digging into it to see how this happened again i don't think um, uh, you know if you are my generation i suppose you'll recognize this lady you might recognize some of the songs these are the carpenters the carpenters if if you remember uh, top of the world that song so it was a brother sister famous singing duo uh, this is karen carpenter and um she developed bulimia right bulimia was where you know uh, figure consciousness was you know important in that industry and she would induce vomiting and and how she induced vomiting was by consuming syrup syrup of ipecac the syrup of ipecac was emetine and it is still available as an over the counter syrup in 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 the us so you you can buy syrup of ipecac and then you have this safe safety data sheet saying fatal so what she used to induce vomiting for bulimia was was syrup of ipecac and of course she died right she, she died as a result and then the whole lobby uh the the fan lobby then therefore convinced the fda to ban this this ipecac it, 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 because at that that time bulimia was not known as a condition so they 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 transferred the whole problem to ipecac and therefore we have a team right uh, having this issue so i wrote back to the editor very strongly because we did additional date i did additional literature searches and found this if you see at the bottom here we compared the efficacy of malaria uh to the in vitro efficacy uh, uh for for uh, for for the amoebic para amoebic protozoa for amoeba amoebiasis and if you look at that you are talking about a thousand fold the ic50s or the inhibitor concentration where you get 50% reduction right is nanomolar for malaria micromolar for uh, amoebiasis so it is a thousand fold more effective in malaria thousand fold more effective and you know it's, and and you know that this dose you know it's 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 all the side effects are dose dependent so i wrote a really strong push back to the editor and he 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 took time to read this and he took time to do his research and came back to me saying very rarely do i change my decision but i think it makes sense and we have to publish this and uh we had probably the first drug repositioning paper for malaria and where emetine came uh, was published and the details of emetine came um, were, were published so i see this as a personal triumph actually so where next right uh side effects are there how do we overcome side effects right so 
vomiting was was a big one the the cardiotoxicity was dose dependent so if you if you're talking of a thousand fold efficacy it is unlikely but still could we do something so we were exploring many routes and this is the wonderful thing about research you have the you have the uh, ability to explore all these routes i'm not going to go into detail chemical derivatization can you change this molecule that we know what the uh, could we change the chemical uh, uh, chemical structure to select for safety further select for safety right uh, could we uh, could we use synergistic partnerships? Pharmacology students there, you will know, right? So synergistic partnerships where you add two things, where one and one is not two, but one and one is three, right? That's fantastic because then you can be, can be uh, you know, existing anti-malarial, can we partner it so that we have efficacy. Novel formulations, can we do the formulatory changes to reduce toxicity, um, counteract toxicity, novel drug discovery, delivery you know you have um drugs that can be now you have the nano nano systems and all that can we do that um i'm not going to we, we have actually tried all this we have got synergistic partnerships we have got um we, we have explored uh, nano nanoparticle delivery but i'm going to just take in the interest of time take you through one one uh, route and that is the chemical derivatization route the reason we selected that was in the 1960s, uh, this drug was made by Roche. Roche was already looking into changing the structure. So we went, to, went back to the 1960s and looked for, um, for, for, the, for the patents, right, to see what possible chemical structures we could do and we could change, right? Now, once this paper came out and Matin came out in the, in the domain, so after about 30 years of nobody talking about emetine. This paper comes out from, it's a combination of very big groups from um, Imperial College and Cambridge and so on, so on, where they then discover, they put emetine into, and uh, d doing cryo work, cryo EM work, they find the binding site, right? They actually discover the binding site of emetine in the ATS ribosome or something like that. Right now, this is is great because now if you know the binding site, we know the structure. Could you then alter it? So, so we can then plan derivatization even better. We can plan structural changes even better now that we know the uh, binding site. So, a drug uh, discovered through repositioning or repurposing. Now we can optimize by rational drug design. Is what what the theme was, and that was fantastic. Uh, Emetine had a lot of um, natural products, not, not because it's a na it's it's a natural de derivative, right? So different trees and plants gave slightly different changes, which we could test. We had the data from Roche, which said that this derivative is is, is useful. So uh, to cut a long story short, uh, this is Priyanka Panwa, uh, again a medic who came in, came to Salford to do her PhD. Um, and we did the designs, we did the modeling, and we we had, I, ha, I know nothing of chemistry, as I told you, but we actually had a bunch of very senior chemists from Manchester Uni, and we all got together and eventually made these effective diastereomers, right? Two, two diastereomers, which were as effective as the amatine, which were predicted to have a better safety profile. Uh, GSK, of course, took it on and, and tested it. It was not only useful in the human stages of malaria parasite, but it was also useful in gametocyte testing. Um, but because, again, because we had, we had published it, which I think was probably naivety on my part, because these kind of things you do not publish. The moment you, you publish and put it in the public domain, um, the patent gets lost and then drug companies lose interest because the pub patent is there in the public domain. So so that was that that was an issue. Actually, we have gone to India, the center, CDRI India, I went to Lucknow uh, um, and I, I, I made this presentation and the clinicians in the audience were saying, oh my God, you know, this is, this is, this is great. So we actually had a MOU with India as well uh, to, because I, 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 I don't, who 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 takes it over as, as long as someone 
takes this product and, and delivers it. We are now into animal work. We are moved into the animal work. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm publishing it. I'm not interested in patents. I'm publishing it. So this is the new dehydromatine paper, which was which was of, of uh, you know details of how we we change the molecule and, and all that. So that's that's a very strong paper. But what was really interesting is, of course, then COVID came, and COVID came, and then emetine now be became a little bit more common in the literature, right? Nobody talked about it. We brought it up. And now, not only were they talking of emetine in, in terms of Zika and Ebola, but if you remember, emetine was also one of the drugs that was coming into the fray for SARS-CoV-2, as effective for SARS-CoV-2. Um, then we actually, I actually contacted the um, the Hong Kong uh, research group on SARS-CoV-2, Professor Malik Pires, who was, of course, a Sri Lankan, uh, and I managed to contact him and said, you know, we have this molecule, we have derivatized it, you know, you are not, not going to get this molecule anywhere. Can you can you check check it, test it on SARS-CoV-2, and lo and behold, it's actually. Uh, effective in the SARS-CoV-2 as well, with very good efficacy, um, uh, like for malaria, right? Um, so we have now gone into uh, now gone into the animal work, uh, but then, and this is where the connection comes. Uh, of, things will take time. Where we're now doing the animal work, and we haven't analyzed the data, but I know that it is it it is looking as if it is safe in in the animal. So. You know, all those safety fears probably were not, were, you know, at the dosages that we are using. So there is promise. Whether a drug company takes it or not, I do not know. They, they probably won't because they cannot make much money from it. I'm just hoping that a government uh, will take it forward. It's there in the public domain. Um, and I'm, of course, in the evening of my research career, I, I, I probably do not have have the time to to develop it further, but we are doing the animal work and it is looking promising. But I would like to leave you with this this um, this. Um, uh, I, I don't know whether you can you can um, read it, but this was an accident. We were looking we were looking high and low for any publication. There was no publication at all on emetine and malaria, and then there was this little letter uh, of malaria being treated. Uh, accidentally, because malaria being mistaken for amoebiasis or amoebic levabsis and treated with metronidazole, uh, with, with emetine, uh, this is 1985, right? Nin the sole publication, uh, a letter from somebody called Ray F, Dr. Ray F. James, uh, malaria being treated, uh, sorry, amoebiasis being treated accidentally. And then they're finding that in all these patients, the malaria disappeared. So, so that is the only evidence we have that, yes, you know, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics all may work because, because this letter is there. And you know what? Where does it come from? If you look carefully, I don't know whether it is clear to you, General Hospital, Jatna. All right. So... Dr. Ray James in 1985 probably uh, was the physician. Um, I, I, I think this was also the time when my father was the surgeon there. So I, I don't know him, but, uh, but isn't, it, isn't that amazing that the only publication with emetine, so that's why I thought I would tell you this story because it was a wonderful, you know, that's the story to tell. And I, I sincerely hope that down the line, maybe my, my PhD students, I have PhD students who are lecturers now, um, I, I sincerely hope that they will take this forward and, um, and uh, hopefully, who knows where, where, where the story will go. Uh, we're talking of research careers and, 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 and successes, however you define success. For me, one of the most, um, you know, the highlights of my career was being was being awarded the full medal oration in 2020 uh, by the Ceylon College of Physicians. It was a it was a it was a spiritual experience to come back, you know, to be to be recognized by your own country, uh, the medical school that I grew up in, that I, that that launched my career, 
And um, yes, anti-malaria drug discovery, going back to our roots was what I talked about. And by roots, I genuinely meant my roots in Sri Lanka and and the natural product roots as well, you know, whether, whether it's, it is quinine or artemisinin or hopefully emetine one day where somebody will see sense and, and recognize the potential, the, the enormous potential of natural products. I hope that will, um, that will, um, uh, um, that will come to fruition one day. Uh, ending, um, you know, uh, I, I talked about success and how do you define success. At the end, that is all. That that is what we are trying to try to trying to get to. Uh, I have two definitions for success, depending on whom I talk to. Uh, when I talk to students, young people like you, uh, the, 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 the definition of success I'd like to put forward um, is, is, is a poem I was taught by my grandfather, again, born and bred in Jaffna from St. Patrick's. Um, the heights of great men reached and kept were not achieved by single flight, for they while their companions slept, kept on toiling through the night. Yes, young people, you have hard work. You know, nothing comes easy. That the hard, that hard work and that road to success. My undergraduates, when I when I when I start off with them, that is that is what that is the message I I give them always. But at my stage of my career. You know, the evening of my career, I would like to think. Um, uh, I think the definition of success is different, right? What is it? Is it getting the gold medal elevation? It is. Be is it becoming professor in a British university? I don't know. And I, I, th I think um, long ago, I, I'm go looking through. My son, my son, my son is there with my father there. Um, my son is 30 years now. I'm looking through his old albums. I found uh, a card uh, sent by his grandfather uh, for his first birthday. And in there was a poem I'd like to share with you. And that is Waldo Emerson's in there. It is Waldo Emerson's definition of success. And this is what I, I'd like to take for myself. Uh, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critiques, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to know that even one life breathed easier because you lived. This is to have succeeded. Thank you very much. I'm deeply, deeply honored for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for your informative speech. And that was quite emotional at the end as well. Thank you. We have reached the end of the wonderful inaugural session of the fifth undergraduate research symposium. I kindly invite Mrs. Satya Sambhavadas, the secretary of the research symposium to deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you, Selene. Good morning to all of you. Let me start by giving the glory to the Almighty for making this event a successful one. Once a great man said, feeling thankfulness and not expressing it is like wrapping a gift and not giving it. So I would like to give the gift of thankfulness to all of you who have made this event a successful one. First of all, on, be on behalf of uh, our organizing committee of the fifth undergraduate research symposium of faculty of allied sciences i would like to extend my grateful thanks to our chief guest
professor sri satguna raja for being with us all this time and spending his precious time uh, with us and giving a very motivational speech thank you sir your presence means a lot for us then i would like to thank our keynote speaker professor niroshini nirmalan though we are apart geographically we were brought together by the technology thanks to the technology thank you very much madam for the enthusiastic motivational and emotional speech about the research about the natural products and the drug discovery that was really an informative speech madam thank you very much for spending time with us then i would like to thank my our great woman our dean mrs devi thabodaran for motivating us supporting us and always giving the valuable advice to make this event a success thank you very much madam and also i would like to extend my thanks to all the staff members of the faculty of allied health sciences who have been rendering their helping hands to us despite their busy schedule and also i would like to thank faculty of medicine for giving us the venue and the other supports a special thanks goes to our sponsors without whom this uh, event is impossible thank you very much for your great support last but not least i would like to thank all the dignitaries and the students and the audience who have been spending your time and listening to us in patience thank you very much and also i would like to get the acceptance of my apologies if i have missed anyone to thank thank you everyone who have been working on screen and off screen to make this event a successful one thank you thank you satya i wish all the presenters best of luck and thank you everyone for making this event a success i kindly invite our uh, invitees to join us with refreshments in the first floor of the who auditorium and the students and presenters can collect their refreshments at the entrance of the auditorium the technical sessions will be starting at 11 am and the venues are track 1 who auditorium track 2 conference hall of faculty of medicine track 3 lecture hall 1 of faculty of medicine and the leaflets which includes the details regarding the papers published in each track is given along with your agenda you can refer it and you can join us in the tracks as well and at Uh, at the final session as the final sessions we have a awarding ceremony for the best paper award for the presenters who are presenting in direct at the who auditorium as well thank you all have a great day ahead